Good evening, everyone. And good evening to the people that are watching in on Zoom. Uh, I'm Kevin Johnson. I'm the photo archivist here and uh, here to welcome you um, to hear Pim talk. So tonight, it's my pleasure to in introduce Pim Van Hemmen. Van Hemmen. <laughs> the Dutch always trip me up a little bit. Um, I first met Pim um, a couple years back when he reached out about doing a, um, an article on the photo photography archives at the museum. And he ended up coming up and visiting. And I, I think he was pretty blown away by what we had here. Um, and as a result, there was a great article, which you can take a look at over on the table. Um, but we developed a friendship and he inquired about possibly showing his photographs. Um, Pim is a sounding, the photo editor at Soundings Magazine and obviously a photographer as well. And when I saw the images, I was blown away and I said, boy, this would be a great place to show this exhibit. Um, and when they came and they went on the wall, um, well, they're stunning, right? Yes. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce Pim, who's gonna tell you about this project of documenting these great ships, um, how he finds them and researches them and the process of getting these shots, which are not as easy as you think. So my pleasure, Tim. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you, Kevin. And thanks to Matt Wheeler and the folks at the museum for hosting the show and for giving me the opportunity to talk about them here. Um, uh, Karen Smith and uh, Gina and the, the staff here at the museum is really, really fantastic. Um, I... Um, I started this project, I'm gonna dive right into it because you, I think you're here to find out about the pictures and the ships. So uh, I started this project because in uh, 2012, I went to get some furniture at Ikea for my son's bedroom who's sitting right here. <laughs> and I drove to Philadelphia because the Elizabeth Ikea didn't have the furniture I wanted. So when I pulled out of the Ikea parking lot with the chair in the back of the car, I was sitting at the traffic lane. I looked, looked across the street. I'm like, what is that? That looks like the SS United States. So what you need to know very quickly, I'll give you a mini biography about myself. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. My grandfather was a ship's engineer. My father was a ship's engineer. My father became the superintendent of ships for the Holland America Line. And as a kid, I used to have posters of Holland America Line ships hanging on the walls. So <clears throat> basically died in the wool and ships, always loved ships. I married a woman who went to Kings Point. Uh, and basically you could lock me up in this museum for a week and I'd be happy as a clam. You just throw a few bananas at me, some boiled eggs and I'm good. So I saw this, I saw the ship. I snapped this picture with my iPhone through the windshield. I drove home. And I said to my wife, you wouldn't believe it. I was at the Ikea in Philadelphia and the SS United States is docked right across the street. It's ridiculous. And she said, you should do a series of photographs about historic ships. You should do just, you know, make it a project. And you, you should call it in extremis, which is, which many of folks in this room probably know, a maritime doctrine that basically, and I'm going to paraphrase here, allows a ship's captain to take extreme measures in extreme situations. Do I have that right, babe? close enough. So anyway, um, that's how it began. This was shot in uh, February of 2012. I went back in May of 2012. This picture is a black and white photo of the SS United States in 1952 that was colorized after the fact. They added the US flag and the name, which was not on the ship yet at the time. And this is during her sea trials. Um, that's the way she looked. This is the way she looked in 2012. It's not pretty. Uh, she's been laid up since she was retired, I think, in uh, 1970, 69 or 70. Um, she was completely stripped of everything, the furniture. If you go to the Smithsonian, you can still see one chair and one coffee table sitting in the Smithsonian Museum. Um, I think some of the other furniture is locked up elsewhere. I've been aboard. I will talk about that later. But in essence, what I try to do with the photographs is to create a record in a visually interesting way. It's not my goal to advocate for saving these ships or not. I'm just trying to make sure that there is some imagery available for the day when they may not be around anymore. Um, as you can see, she's not in great shape. 
they spend an amazing amount of money just keeping her afloat. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of three or four million dollars a year just to keep her afloat. Uh, they're pumping water out of her. Uh, it's not a good scene. So I try to make interesting photographs. I like bright color. I like contrast. I like blacks. The photographs in the exhibit are printed on aluminum uh, for a couple of reasons. I like the luminescence from the, that the aluminum gives. But more than that, uh, it's kind of like an ode to ships. You know, aluminum is an industrial strength material. Um, some of these ships are built out of aluminum or have aluminum funnels or aluminum superstructures. Um, and I just like the connection in that way. So that's the bow shot. Um, I shot the SS United States from land. I have photographed it from the water. I try to photograph from the water whenever I can. Uh, I have a Zodiac rib, which I've towed over most of the East Coast to take pictures of these various vessels. Um, this I shot standing on the dock. Um, I try to look for just interesting things. I see a face in there with a nose and two eyes and I like the, the oil streaks and the rust and the peeling paint. I love the rivets. You know, it's just, I try to capture the industrial strength of the vessels. Uh, this is the image that hangs in the exhibit right here. Uh, it's one of the better ones I got. I like to eliminate uh, distractions. I have photographs of it from across the parking lot with the Wendy's restaurant in the foreground, the Ikea flags, traffic lights. They're all kind of interesting, but in the end, this is what I'm trying to capture. Um, I have probably hundreds of photos of the SS United States that I could put up here, but I won't. There's a lot of boats, to, there's a lot of ships to talk about. So this is the USS Olympia. Uh, this was shot in 2019. Um, she carried the body of the uh, unknown soldier back from uh, France in 1921, which is one of the last things she did. She was used at the um, uh, Battle of um, Manila Bay, uh, which was the flagship for Admiral Dewey, uh, where he gave the order to fight the Spanish, uh, which was a a huge victory for the United States and kind of put the United States on the map in terms of uh, 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 you know world power. Um, the way I got to her is by using the rib. Um, I try to get to the ships either at sunrise or sunset because I like what's called the golden hour for my photographs. So I dunked the boat. The nearest boat ramp was in Burlington, New Jersey, which is about <clears throat> 45 minutes north of Philadelphia. So I had to navigate the Delaware River in the dark. Um, this is actually when it was getting late. I literally started in the dark. Uh, along the way, there were a lot of logs on the Delaware River. Uh, I hit one, um, broke the fin on my outboard, but it kept going. Um, and then that's when I got to the ship. This is already later in the day. Um, you can tell by the light, but you know, that's my reflection or my shadow right there from standing on the Zodiac. Uh, I drive myself. Um, I tend to spend anywhere from <clears throat> an hour to four hours hanging around the ship. It depends on the light. It depends on the conditions. It depends on how much success I'm having. Uh, and if opportunity is rife, I just stick around and keep shooting. Uh, if things turn bad on me, I quit. And then I hope to return at a later time. Most of these have been shot in one take. Um, so this is the Olympia. I've only been to once. It turned out to be a great day. Blue skies, uh, calm waters. I like to work with the reflections in the water. Um, I try to get what I call, I call this a boat portrait. I try to get a shot of the ship in the best possible way that I can which is not always easy because sometimes they're facing the wrong way, the light is wrong. Um, there's a thousand ways in which um, circumstances can prevent me from getting a, a, a clean boat portrait. But it's not just the boat portrait I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get details. I'm trying to get you know, a better sense of what the ship's built out of. Um, I'm not gonna show you a lot of details from the Olympia. That's the Moshulu on the left. Um, but to try to look for shapes and color and graphics and just try and get an interesting representation of the ship. Um, so that's, that's another boat portrait. It's not as easy to get as you might think. I spent a lot of time. 
that's shot with a 16 millimeter lens because there's no other room to back up and shoot it with a longer lens. So it's not an ideal um, lens to use on ships. Um, you saw the Mishulu in the other shot before. So while I was there, I took advantage. Uh, I went to get the Olympia, um, but the light just happened to shine on the Mishulu alone, which is crazy. You can see the other ships are not, uh, which is a stroke of luck. Uh, I doubt I'll ever get conditions like that again. What's the history of that ship? She's, I think, from, I'm glad you asked, I had my cheat sheet, because I've shot so many ships now at this point that I can't really remember what's what anymore. Um, she's a four-masted steel bark built as Kurt by William Hamilton and Company at Port Glasgow in Scotland in 1904. Uh, and she's the largest remaining original wind jammer. She's 396 feet uh, overall and uh, went as fast as 17 knots at one point, which is screaming for a tall ship. Uh, right across the river from the Mishulu is the USS New Jersey, one of the four Iowa class battleships built for World War II. Um, she's the most decorated of the Iowa class ships. This is her firing uh, uh, her uh, 16 inch guns. Um, she now sits in Camden, New Jersey as a museum ship. Um, she's in remarkably good shape. I've slept aboard her with my son when he was a Cub Scout. I hid my head underneath a, a exhibit panel to sleep because they kept all the lights on in the ship in the middle of the night. Um, you can get lost on these things. I mean, it's like almost 900 feet long. Um, and again, I got lucky. It was the same morning as the Olympia. Good light, uh, clear skies. And it's really, <clears throat> it's really fun to sit in a boat and just float around these big ships and look up at them. And, uh, you know, you get to see the shape. I mean, this is a bizarre looking vessel. If you really think about it, the way the hull comes in from the bow, uh, there's a reason for everything. I was reading about the USS New Jersey's construction uh, and um, basically she was started, uh, she was started in the depression, at the end of the depression, really helped end the depression. 1938 is when they later keeled. She was finished a year after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Um, at the time, the Navy shipyard in Philadelphia employed 4,500 people. And in the middle of the war, they employed uh, 47,000 people. So it did help to end the depression. 30% um, of those people were women. Uh, and I just like being able to see the, you know, the plates in the hull. You know, people think of ships as being smooth. At least people who are not in the maritime industry. They look at a ship from afar and they go, it's, you know, as, as smooth as a baby's bottom. It's not. Um, and in particular, over time, when a ship takes a beating, um, you start seeing, you know, the imperfections. Um, the Savannah is one of my favorite ships in the world. <clears throat> I think she's incredibly beautiful. Um, she was built in the late 50s. Uh, Eisenhower got it in his head that after World War II, he wanted to have um, an Adams for Peace program, and he wanted to send a ship around the world that was a uh, non-warship, uh, uh, a merchant ship that was powered by nuclear power. And um, I was just talking to someone in the room here uh, whose parents were on the Savannah, but also there was a former third mate of the Savannah who was in the room earlier, who's not here right now, which is said, yeah, um, which was fascinating. Anyway, the, um, the Savannah, uh, to get to her, again, I left in the dark in, from some fairly uh, kind of iffy neighborhood on the outskirts of Baltimore. Uh, I dunked a boat. And at the time I thought, when I come back, my car and my trailer are gonna be gone. My car is gonna be sitting on blocks. The wheels are gonna be gone. Um, and I actually scouted her out first. What I do a lot of the time, or what I did a lot of the time was I go on Google Earth to see which way the ship would face. I wanted to know how she was docked. If she was facing north or south or in or out. Uh, so that I could tell if I wanted to be there at sunrise or sunset. <clears throat> and I knew the Savannah, I wanted to get at sunrise, but I was there the night before I got a hotel room 
And I dunked a boat, this is the morning of, but I dunked a boat the night before and I went out and I scouted her out. And when I got there, the ship's crew, the government still owns the Savannah. They maintain a crew of seven on board, including a ship's engineer. And the ship's engineer was getting off the ship and I was tooling around the ship and he saw me and we started talking and he said, you gotta, if you want pictures, you gotta get under the bow. That's the best thing. So this is the morning of, and I motored out to the ship and waited for the sun to rise. And this is when she was, thank you. Um, this is right after the sun popped over the horizon. And I actually got there too early. The shadows of the container terminals were still on the ship when I got there at first. Because the sun was so low in the sky. The sun was so low in the sky that um, it was casting its shadows from the, the, the uh, gantry cranes and the containers that were stacked on shore like a quarter mile away on the ship. So I had to wait a little longer to get this shot. So this is the boat portrait. And this is actually not a flattering shot of the ship. It's shot with a wide, fairly wide lens, makes the bow bend down. I actually don't like the way she looks in this photo. This is where I got underneath. And when I got there, I was like, this is great. I'm just gonna wait for the light. You can still see the shadows of the containers right above the, uh, the waterline. And uh, I was just waiting for the sun to rise a little more to get a nice clean light. But I didn't like that noose at the back. Uh -huh. I was, I guess, going to wreck my shot. So um, I just maneuvered the boat until I got right, I got the noose right over here above my head. And I waited for the light. And then this guy pops his head over the bow and he's like, hey, you can't be here. Gosh, <laughs> this is going to wreck everything. This is like the moment, you know. And I said, no, 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 it's all right. I talked to the ship's engineer yesterday. He told me I should take this picture. He's like, oh, okay, that's all right then. And he went away. And I wanted him to go away because the last thing I wanted was a head sticking over the bow of the ship, you know? So uh, that was the result. Um, and I'm sorry? How can you say when they're that sad? Well, she's got, she's got, so she was designed by, um, uh, a, a really good naval architect who was told, make her pretty. We don't really care how many passengers she can carry. We're not too concerned about how much freight she can carry. We wanted to go around the world and be a goodwill ambassador and, and she needs to look good. And I've heard rumors, I don't know if it's true, that they said that, um, uh, that don't worry too much about putting cranes on, too many cranes on her to, to lift cargo. Just that, that could just make things look messy, you know, <laughs> but um, they moved the um, I'm going to go back for a second. I think one reason why she looks so good is the house is very, very far aft on the ship. And the reason for that is the nuclear reactor and the fuel rods had to be the fuel rods had to be accessible so they could exchange them. And the fuel rods in the reactor are sitting midship. So the, the, the architect, the naval architect had to move the house back to accommodate that, which also uh, made sure that they lost cargo space because a nuclear reactor takes up a lot of space. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and I was standing on the boat, <clears throat> I was looking up and the wide angle lens on my camera could barely fit it in because if I backed the boat up, the noose would come back in the shot. <laughs> So I'm craning, I'm craning. I'm like, just make sure that guy doesn't show up. Make sure that the light stays and it all, it all worked out. So then I just tooled around the ship literally for a couple of hours and I tried to cover from every angle possible looking for opportunities to make interesting photos. Uh, I like this picture a lot. It's, it's shot at water level and it really makes you feel the size of the ship. This is the stern. She's got a canoe stern, which is also really beautiful. I mean, everything about the ship, I think, is done just right. And I think this gives you a sense of the, the size. I mean, she's really, you know, these are these are not tiny ships. So in Baltimore, I went there. I went to Baltimore for the Savannah. But then I found out that they had a steam tug at the um, Museum of Industry. And this, this tug actually has a very sad story because... She was designed as a goodwill ambassador for the city of Baltimore, and she would welcome guests and bring VIPs out. And when um, there was a, uh, 
a, a German merchant submarine that arrived right before World War I and the steamboat, uh, steam tug Baltimore went out to greet it. It was the official welcoming vessel for the city of Baltimore. She was an icebreaker. She took school kids out on tours. She would move barges um, occasionally, probably mostly garbage. But anyway, she, um, she was owned by the city. They didn't want her anymore. She was eventually sold to private owners, uh, the DuPonts actually, and uh, they pumped a lot of money into it. They refurbished her and then she sank. They lifted her up, they fixed her up and they donated her to the Museum of Industry in uh, Baltimore, but they don't want her anymore. Um, uh, so this is the, the wooden house, which they're trying to keep in one piece. Uh, I love reflection shots. Whenever I'm around a ship, I look for reflections in the water. It's just, I like the graphicness of it. I know, I know this is about ships, but, you know, ships are in water, so. Um, and I love graphic images. Um, so I look for details, again, using the reflection. Um, that one's hanging on the wall here. And you can really see how these ships were built. You know, you, you don't realize there's many layers that are riveted together and, you know, some of these ships are wrought iron, some of them are iron, some of them are steel, uh, some of them are arc welded. Uh, there's many different ways of building ships over time, but I like to see the details and I think you can really see it there, which you don't, when you have a boat portrait, you don't see the minutiae, you know. Um, and I like this picture just because it's a, it makes, it makes the boat look good, which she isn't in some ways. So she's, the, the museum is, industry is trying to get rid of her now. Uh, the problem they're having is that it says, it's stipulated that if they get rid of her, she must remain in the city of Baltimore, <clears throat> which there's not too many people in the city of Baltimore who want a hundred year old tug, you know? So this is Wavertree. Um, she, um, she was built in England. Uh, she was what's called a, a tramp or a tramper, uh, never sailed on a regular schedule, uh, ended up basically picking up cargo wherever she could. I photographed her in New York City, where she's at South Street Seaport. I dunked my rib at uh, Liberty, uh, uh, Liberty State Park. Thank you. Right behind the Statue of Liberty. Part of the fun of this is I love to be on the water. I love to be in a boat. And this is an excuse to get on my boat. So this is not an ideal situation. She's, you know, they, they like to dock the tall ships with their bow spritz over the dock, which is the way it was done. Um, it's not good for the photographer. I'd like, I'd like them to turn her around, but that's, that was not the case. So that's the best I could do in terms of a boat portrait. Um, she's been refurbished. This was shot in 2012. Jonathan Bohr, who's the president and CEO of um, South Street Seaport, at the time the Peking was just sitting to her right. And the Peking is a far bigger ship, uh, and but she's black. Black ships are kind of hard to photograph. Um, and I knew Peking was going to go bye bye. Um, Peking went back to Hamburg eventually, and Jonathan Bohr said Waver Tree has a history with New York City which Peking doesn't. Wavertree visited uh, New York in the late 1800s uh, once. That's the only connection she has to New York. Peking never visited until they brought her there. Um, but again, I look for details, um, reflections, color. Um, she's in pretty bad shape here. Three years later, they put her in dry dock and they spent millions of dollars uh, fixing her up. She's in great shape now. And they're actually preparing her to go sailing again, which is really cool. Um, that's at the stern. It's right, the, the rudder post is right there at the bottom. Um, and just interesting details, the moon, the rigging. They completely re-rigged re her during the uh, restoration. Um, SS Columbia uh, is in um, near Detroit or was near Detroit when I photographed her. So I towed my uh, rib out to the Great Lakes and I got a flattened I-80 <laughs> uh, in the middle of the night, which was not fun. I, I did have a second spare. You can see it at the top left there. So I was, I was, I was prepared for trouble. Uh, and then when the when, when Lake Erie is very shallow and the wind blows hard out of the west on Lake Erie, it actually pushes all the water from the west of Lake Erie to the east. 
and it lowers the level of Lake Erie by as much as three or four feet. Every boat ramp near Detroit didn't have enough water for me to dunk my boat. I actually had to drive an hour south of Detroit to find a boat ramp at high tide, or they don't have a tide, but like what their high tide is to get the boat in the water. So I had to run up the river to um, uh, Detroit in the dark to get to the SS Columbia. The SS Columbia was a, a, a steamer, a steamship that delivered uh, people to uh, Boblo Island, which is actually in Canada across the river, which was a, um, where people went for entertainment. Um, and both the um, uh, SS Columbia and her sister ship, the uh, St. Clair, delivered people from Detroit to this island, uh, you know, all week long. And uh, she's actually part of the civil rights movement, which a lot of people don't know. Five years before Rosa Parks refused to get out of the front of the bus, a black woman got in 1948, got on the SS Columbia. And when she sat down with her girlfriends who were all white, the crew came up to her and said, you can't be on the ship, you got to get off. And she paid 85 cents to get on. And the, uh, the woman she was with, her boss said to the white guys who were throwing her off, she'll go very quietly. And she was, that made her even more angry. And when she was taken off the ship, she took her 85 cents, which they gave back to her. And she threw it at the ship, went to the local NAACP chapter and sued. She won in court. The corporation that ran the ships uh, decided to challenge it and went all the way to the Supreme Court where they lost uh, five years before Rosa Parks, uh, which a lot of people don't know. Um, anyway, um, people were trying to save her. They shrink wrapped her, which was a mistake, um, as you can see, because the shrink wrap didn't last and it doesn't help her. Um, this is where she was sitting with the St. Clair right behind me as I took this photo. And she was a sad sight. And there was a guy in New York who was trying to save her and bring her to the Hudson River and run her up and down the Hudson River after restoring her. Sadly, soon after this, he died. And the whole effort kind of almost went up in smoke. But people took up the cause. And she's now in Buffalo. They actually took her to um, Toledo and patched her up enough to tow her to uh, Buffalo, where she's been for the last 10 years almost. Um, she's stuck there, just still trying to get her to New York. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. Um, but because it was very hard to get a good boat portrait, so to speak, uh, the light was in the wrong direction, the boat looked terrible, and there wasn't much of a boat portrait to be shot. Um, I started shooting details, and I liked this little cloud. And I actually played with this cloud a lot. I actually have it coming out of the smokestack, like the smokestacks <laughs> work, which it doesn't. Uh, I didn't put it in the show because I didn't want to put too many pictures in it. But um, And on the inside, she's still got mahogany um, and a uh, triple expansion engine that they're going to try and make operable. Um, maybe they'll pull it off, but it costs $3 million just to get it to Buffalo. It's probably going to cost many millions more to get it to New York and operable. So right, um, right near her, that's the St. Clair on the right, and that's the uh, Columbia on the left. Sadly, the St. Clair was there, somebody was also trying to save her. They belong to the same company, you can tell by the smokestack colors. Um, the St. Clair in 2018 had a fire and her wooden superstructure burned down all the way down to the hull. Um, so, bringing back to St. Clair is gonna be a challenge. I didn't get a lot of pictures of her. I was concentrating on the Columbia because I knew the people and I could get on the ship. Um, now I'm sad I didn't get on the St. Clair to photograph her because she's gone in essence. Um, but again, reflections, water, the steel plates. Um, and when you see these ships, they're so ungainly looking, you know, but the hulls are, the hulls are, perfectly fine. I mean, they're propelled by, you know, engines that are not that powerful and they were able to do 12 knots or so. Um, this ship has an interesting history. So the, she started as the Juniata in the early 1900s. And then in, uh, uh, she was laid up during the depression and in 1937, I think the Moore Castle burned off Asbury Park 
and many people died in the fire and they changed the laws and you couldn't have wood aboard ships anymore. And the Juniata had a, a wooden superstructure. And somebody got in their head and said, let's take the wooden superstructure off. Let's redesign her. Let's put a, a metal superstructure on her. And she was redesigned by the same guy who designed the Savannah. Um, the smokestack is fake, which is one of his trademarks. George Sharp designed her. Um, and what's really cool about her, she's maintained by a bunch of octogenarians in Muskegon, Michigan, who are completely devoted to the ship. And when I was there in uh, 2012, uh, the last captain, when the ship was laid up in 1970, in 2012, he was in his 90s already, and he was still working on the ship, trying to keep her afloat and in shape. Um, they did all the painting themselves, which you can tell here. Um, <laughs> but I really admire these people. I had dinner with one couple who met on the uh, Milwaukee Clipper. They were, in love. they were in love with the ship because they fell in love on the ship. Uh, and they live right across the harbor from her. And with about a, a dozen or a couple do dozen really dedicated volunteers, they're keeping the ship running. I, I followed them on Facebook. And I just read this week that um, they spent $15,000 hiring a contractor to um, repaint the port side of the ship. That's what it costs to repaint the port side. It's going to cost another, probably more than 15000 to do the starboard side, which faces the water. So I went out the night before. That there was a boat ramp right next to the ship, which was really convenient. Doesn't happen often. Um, and this was the night before, there were a lot of clouds and the light wasn't good, but I like to make the ships look like they're still at sea sometimes. Um, and this could be somewhere on the ocean or the Great Lakes. Um, same here um, and same there. No dock lines, no anchor roads, uh, trying to pretend she's still sailing. And that's the boat portrait. And that's the bow with the anchor chain, which is right here behind me. I like this picture a lot. Again, it's like the industrial strength. It's you don't see much stuff like this being built anymore, especially in America, you know. Um, and I like this picture because I was talking about the number of plates. If you look at this, you know, it looks a little messy, it doesn't look too clean, you know, in the construction, but it worked. Um, and that's one of the lifeboats. I was telling someone here before. Uh, they work really hard to keep just everything afloat and going and in ship shape, but they can't keep up with the wood. And you can see the rub rail and the lifeboat is popping off. I didn't include the picture, but I actually looked inside the lifeboat when I was on the ship and the wooden benches and everything on the inside. You can see the, the hints of orange on the, on the wood from, you know, the, the, everything was orange on the inside, but it's all falling apart. So um, in 2013, we were here on vacation here in Maine. We drove back to New Jersey, uh, which is where we lived at the time. My son was going to um, the Manning football camp in Louisiana. And I was like, let's see which ships are along the route. <laughs> so I drove him down to Louisiana and we stopped in Chattanooga where the Delta Queen was laid up uh, and being run as a boutique hotel. I threw this in there. This is not the kind of picture I usually show, but these are the conditions I encounter sometimes. The uh, Tennessee River was completely overflowing its banks. The water was flying by. And I had brought my father's old dinghy inflatable on the back of the minivan, which I was gonna pump up with a foot pump and then get in the Tennessee River and float around the Delta Queen and take pictures. And I decided that wasn't a good idea. So I bailed on that idea and I stayed on shore but this was not the photo I was looking for. So this was the night before we stayed in the hotel. I took pictures from the bridge or the bridges uh, and nothing really came of it. So the next morning, my son and I got up and we walked over that bridge behind the ship, which is a, a pedestrian bridge now. Chattanooga is a really cool town actually. Um, and that provided better opportunities. This is still shot the night before with clouds in the sky. And is the only picture I could get out of it of the paddle wheel. Um, this is the next morning when the light was good um, and I was able to shoot this from the pedestrian bridge. The uh, Delta Queen has a fascinating history. Her sister ship was the Delta King. They were both built in uh, the first three decks and the engine that were built in Scotland in 1926 
shipped in parts to Stockton, California, where both ships were put together and the upper decks were constructed. And from 1927 till about 37, they ran between San Francisco and Sac Sacramento and Stockton delivering people and doing uh, weekend cruises. Then they built a highway and the ships were obsolete. Then World War II broke out and um, the Navy come and commandeered the ships and used them to get uh, uh, injured sailors and soldiers off hospital ships back to shore. That's what they did during the war. And after the war, uh, Delta King remained in Sacramento, where she still is. And Delta Queen was taken through the Panama Canal to New Orleans and brought up the Mississippi, where she spent 50 years navigating uh, the Mississippi River and the other rivers in the interior. Um, she needed an act of Congress to be able to do that because of the Moore Castle regulation, because she's got a wooden interior. She wasn't allowed to be used for um, passenger carrying. And they kept getting exemptions every four years, or every eight years, they had to get an exemption to be able to use the ship for passenger, passenger carrying ab abilities. Um, and she did that for 50 years until 2008 when Congress didn't renew it. Then she ended up in Chattanooga and was laid up as a boutique hotel, which is when I photographed her. And since then uh, she's been towed to Homa, Louisiana where there, there's a, an organization that's trying to restore her and bring her back to river service. Uh, it's been 10 years or almost 10 years, eight years. I'm not sure it's ever gonna happen. Uh, so after I dropped my son off in Houston, uh, in Louisiana, I drove to Houston and uh, to photograph the USS Texas, uh, which was um, the only battleship to serve in both World War I and World War II. Uh, she uh, bombed the French in Africa, or, uh, or bombed, she, uh, she uh, excuse me, bombarded. bombarded, thank you. The French in Africa, the Germans uh, on D-Day, and the uh, Japanese at Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Uh, 14 inch guns, uh, Pride of Texas, uh, State Ship of Texas. She was made a, a museum ship in 1948. Uh, when I found her, she was sitting in a basin at the San Jacinto uh, Monument. And um, it's funny because, again, I had the inflatable dinghy and I was going to dunk that in the basin. I was thinking, I got to drag it across this enormous lawn from the parking lot and then I got to pump her up. And then I'm going to dunk her across this huge riprap into the basin. And then I'm probably going to get arrested. <laughs> so I was like, this is the night before I saw this. And I thought that could be in the Pacific. You know, it could be like a storm in the Pacific. So I really liked this picture. Again, I was trying to make it look like she was um, at sea. But um, when I was walking across the lawn, um, I was like, oh, that's even better. <laughs> Um, and I had a lot of fun making this photo because my whole intent was to show her a flow, but having her sit there in the lawn, I had to really navigate the lawn for a long time to find a spot where I could make it look like she was sitting in the grass. Um, she was just pulled out of the basin last year. They're doing a 30 or $35 million renovation in a dry dock, but she's homeless. Houston doesn't want her back and they're looking for a new home for her. So um, Galveston has expressed interest. Beaumont has expressed interest. Um, I don't know where she's gonna end up. Uh, sorry, Sears. Sears <laughs> so not too far from Houston, my son was still at football camp and I was trying to get as many ships in there as I could. Um, I said, I'll go photograph the Alyssa in Galveston. And, um, she has an interesting story because she ended up in Piraeus, Greece, and she was about to get chopped up when somebody found her and said, we're going to bring her back to Texas and we're going to make her the state ship of Texas, which she is now, uh, the, the tall ship of Texas. Uh, and they pulled it off. I mean, uh, although the year before I was there in 2011, again, this is where the, the little inflatable dinghy came in handy, which I dragged through the parking lot on a wheelie and pumped up on the dock. And it's funny because there's a restaurant to the right of the ship. And I was floating around with my little dinghy oars, just going around the ship. And there were people eating lunch and you know, they're, they're talking to me like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm taking pictures. I looked like an idiot, but it was okay. Um, but um, 
the illicit is really a great story. I mean, it's it's if you get a chance to read up on her, uh, a bunch of people just got it in their head. We can save the ship. We can turn her into a tall ship. We can make her sail again. And they do. They sail her. Although in 2011, the Coast Guard inspected her and found that she was leaking very badly. And they took away her license to carry passengers. And they raised three million bucks and fixed her up. And they were redoing the decks, the wooden decks, all the way from bow to stern. It's really impressive. I don't know how these people pulled this off. So it's really... There's some really dedicated, passionate people out there who are trying to save old ships, but it's it's not easy and it's not cheap. So she's she's tough to photograph where she sits. Um, so this is more or less the best I could do with that. I love these old iron hulls, like you know, the pock marks and everything. They're they're just I think they're super photogenic, uh, and then the reflections in the water. Rudders, I can't get enough of rudders. And, <laughs> and she's, you know, the official ship of the Lone Star State. So there's stars all over, all over the ship. Um, and then um, I found out that somebody's still sailing uh, old ships. And that's um, the Maritime Museum of San Diego, which has a fantastic ship collection. If you, I don't know if any of you've ever been there, but um, if you love ships, and you find yourself in San Diego, set at least two days aside to check out the ships at the, the museum. Um, so this is the Star of India, which is kind of the star of the museum. And um, I was there for four days. And uh, <clears throat> I stayed in the hotel across the street so I could get up early every morning and get out there before the sun came up. And that's what I found when one morning when I walked up which is just bizarre with the palm trees and the street lights and the, <laughs> the tall ships. I like that picture. And again, the hull, I can't get enough of the hulls. And uh, they sail her. Um, oops. Um, and um, I called them up and I said, can I go with you guys? And they're like, come on along. So I went out with them <clears throat> and um, I spent one day, they sail it for two days. So I spent one day photographing her from another ship and one day aboard. And this was from aboard when they were getting her ready in the morning. Um, and it's a schooner America. I got out on the Sprit. Unfortunately, when I got permission to go on the Sprit, she was backlit. So all my pictures from right up there at the tippy top of the bow Sprit are not even worth showing. Um, they're, they're nice little personal mementos for me, but it's amazing. They, um, the, uh, the captain is a, a licensed tall ship captain and the rest of the crew is all volunteers and they train them all year long, every year, year after year. It takes a lot of people to throw a ship like that. They train them in all the safety measures. They wear harnesses. They go up there. They unfurl the sails. They, you know, they do everything you need to do to sail a tall ship. And, um, She's never had an engine. Uh, they never put an engine in her and they take two tugboats and tow her out and they sail on the Pacific. And at the end of the day, they bring her back in and there's a huge parade. I mean, everybody comes out. It's, it's an insane show. If you want to see a lot of beautiful ships sailing, uh, <clears throat> they're actually going to do it this year. So if you find yourself in San Diego, I think in October, I think it's October, um, it's definitely worth it. But um, I like to shoot them on static display. I actually, you know, love to go out on the water, but uh, since most of these ships are photographed in static display, I do, I did want to shoot the Star of India uh, sitting at the dock. Um, and um, red's just a great color, you know, red and black. Um, so because I was there for four days, it was like being in a candy store. Um, so I got up one morning <clears throat> and that's a hall in the America. Uh, sorry. <laughs> that's a hall in the America line. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the star in the on the left. And uh, I think that's the HMS Surprise, which is a replica ship, uh, which was made for the movies, I think. I think uh, Master and Commander. Um, so it was really cool. I get up, I go to the harbor, there's fog, and the ship comes out of the fog, which is just a cool juxtaposition. Um, that is the California. Uh, and to me, it looks like a battle scene, like they've just yeah. been in a 
in a sea battle. It could be master and commander, you know, with all this, it's fog. Uh, and it's what's neat is the naval base is right on the other side of the harbor, which makes for a lousy backdrop for me. I don't want all those aircraft carriers and all that stuff in the background of my classic ships, you know. So when I got up two mornings in a row, there was a big, dark fog bank. And I'm like, somebody's smiling on me, you know. So this is actually, um, so here's one of the reasons why I do this. These ships are not all going to last. And this is a Russian sub, which was built in the 1960s which I think went to Finland and then ended up in the United States and the Maritime Museum took it on and it was on display and they had thousands of school kids going through this thing and they rigged it so they could look through a periscope, all kinds of cool stuff. Well, about two or three years ago, it turned out she was so rotten that they just couldn't dedicate any more of the museum's money to this ship. And they looked around and said, well, Star India over here, Russian sub over there, bye bye Russian sub, and they scrapped her. Um, but um, she's ominous looking, and she was tailing American ships through the Atlantic uh, in the 1970s, you know. Um, and that's the HMS surprise, the replica. I, I don't do replicas, but I just love the contrast of the wooden, the black wooden ship with the black, you know, metal sub. Um, and they have, just going back, they have. Tony, I, I could have shown you a hundred pictures from the San Diego Maritime Museum. They just have an amazing collection of ships. Uh, how am I doing on time? We are at uh, 20, okay, good. Um, so this one I got from my brother who's listening. Rick, this one's for you. Um, this is the Kalakala, which was uh, built in the 1920s, burned and lost a superstructure. And then some guy, and she sailed in San Francisco. And some guy in Seattle got in his head that he wanted to turn her into a ferry. And his wife said, you should make it an art deco ferry. <laughs> so in the 1930s, they did this. And she got all kinds of not so nice nicknames. One of them was the Silver Slug. And uh, the Scandinavian community has a word that sounds like Silver Slug, but means cockroach. And that's what they called her. Um, but she sailed um, in uh, Puget Sound uh, and uh, during World War II uh, ran workers to the Navy Yard across Puget Sound from Seattle. It's a car ferry. Um, she had an engine that made her vibrate wickedly, uh, a problem that they never completely lit, uh, licked. Um, she had a lot of issues because of the way she was constructed. The, the captain couldn't see the bow of the boat from the bridge. He couldn't see over the front of it. So, and even the little winglets on the bridge couldn't help him. They were basically flying blind when they operated this ferry. Um, so uh, my mom bought us a trip to Alaska on Holland America line. We came back. My son and my wife flew back because he had football practice. And my daughter and I took the car down to Tacoma and rented a little boat and putt-putted our way across uh, the bottom of the sound uh, to find the silver slug. So this is in 2013. By then she'd been in Alaska being used as a fish cannery and she was abandoned up there. And some guy got in his head, I'm gonna save the Kalakala. And for 20 years, she lingered all over the Pacific Northwest and wasn't saved. And I got there in 2013 and Unfortunately, it was a cloudy day. It's the Pacific Northwest. I don't know why I thought it was going to get sunshine, but um, so the, the photos aren't great, but I threw them in here uh, because, again, she's no more. Uh, they scrapped her about two or three years after this, and she was very controversial already at the time when I photographed her. They, the authorities wanted her gone. The Coast Guard wanted her gone, and they finally basically took a, they ripped her up. They saved some pieces which are being displayed as artwork in public parks, but that's about it. Um, and uh, I came across the lilac by accident in New York City. I didn't realize on the Lower West Side uh, was this US Coast Guard uh, lighthouse tender. And um, this is the boat portrait, which is nothing to write home about, but I figured you wanted to see what she looked like today. Uh, that's the Freedom Tower. So this is in 2013, 2014, I think. Um, but again, <laughs> because I couldn't get a good boat portrait, I went for details. Um, 
and the light was crazy. I don't know. This looks like it was lit by a movie set or something. I'm expecting, you know, Errol Flynn or somebody to pop in there in a second. Um, and again, I, I just love shooting the holes. Uh, and that's New Jersey across the way. Um, and this is really the kind of stuff I like. This is, these are the kinds of pictures that I like to create. So that brings us back to the beginning. We started uh, with the SS United States in Philadelphia with me looking across the parking lot. And in 2015, I got on the ship and I, I looked up and I was like, can I go up there? And they were like, yeah, you can go up there. So I climbed up to the top. This is where the, uh, the iceberg watch would stand uh, when they were crossing. So when they're crossing the North Atlantic, they put some guy up there to freeze his ass off to look out for icebergs. Um, I think he did have a little enclosed compartment. There was an open and a closed compartment at the top. So I climbed up there and then there's the Ikea. <laughs> That's it. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, this is mostly about uh, the prints. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are on aluminum. Mm -hmm. What's the process? Is it a flat plate of aluminum? And yeah. Then, uh, I, I don't know the technical way they do it. They're made in North Carolina in a lab that basically they invented this process. It's called dye sublimation. And they put a coating on it. And then they meld the inks into the coating. And we ask people not to touch them, but you can touch it. I'm not inviting you to do it, but you can. Um, you, you clean them with a, uh, what are those cloths called? They're microfiber cloths. Uh, and you can use um, Windex if you want to, to do it. Uh, they're, they're very durable. They're not durable in the sense that these are um, uh, floating mounts. So the corners are not protected. If I drop it, the corner will bend and it, that's it, it's over. But that process actually prints on flat. Yeah, it's a sheet of aluminum. They put a coating on it. They print onto the coating, and then um, they put an aluminum frame behind it. That's what supports it. So the the, the, the aluminum is only it's less than an eighth of an inch thick. So there's nothing over the printing that protects the. No, it's in it's it's not in the aluminum. It's in the coating, and then the coating sits on top of the aluminum. Uh, but there's no, there's no plastic, there's no acrylic, nothing like that. So, um, have you done any light ships? Um, I have some light ships. I was actually going to throw, uh, what's the light ship in New York City? Yeah, no, Ambrose. Ambrose. I was going to throw Ambrose in there, but I, I decided it was too much for an hour. And then where, where can you see all these? <laughs> do you have a book, a collection? Well, I want to do a book. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do a photo book and I'm, I have a contact in New York to do it. I'm hoping to find more. Um, I mean, I have enough photos to choke a horse um, and I want to shoot more ships. I'm not done. Uh, you know, I kind of stopped doing this while raising children, uh, but I want to take it up again and, and photograph more ships. So I have, I have Ambrose. I have the one that's sitting across the harbor in New Jersey at um, uh, Liberty Landing. Uh, I photographed the one in Baltimore. Uh, why are you interested in light ships? Well, uh, I mean, I think they are uh, in extremis. Uh, I mean, they're definitely yeah. they're going away. And Absolutely. They're such amazing parts of uh, the maritime history of yep. the U.S. And they were pretty interesting. To look. Yeah, they are. They're photogenic and they're red. So. <laughs> I believe so. It is. Any other questions? No. Shoot. Uh, what kind of camera were you shooting with? And are these like medium format or are 35 millimeter? These are all shot digital and they were shot on state of the art cameras in, well, actually they weren't state of the art anymore in 2012. 5D Mark II's Canons. I still own them. They're both dying right now. I need to get a new camera. But um, at the time, they shot the cleanest, one of the cleanest, biggest digital files you could get. Uh, and I wanted that because I knew I wanted to make the prints large. Um, but I, it's time for a new camera. I need something with an even bigger file so I can make them even bigger. <laughs> Don't tell my wife because she knows how much they cost. 
Do you have any uh, salt water issues with the cameras? Really I think actually, so I work for a boating magazine. I think both of my cameras recently died because of salt water exposure. They spend a lot of time inches above the water with waves. And I think that's why they're toast. And they lasted 15 years, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Film cameras probably didn't last that long. Any questions online? No, anybody else? Yeah, you do it all in raw format. Yes, yeah, I shoot everything in raw and JPEG. And then I work the raw file to make the prints because it just gives more detail. And, and I really need the dynamic range you get from a raw file because you know, if you have a white ship with a black bottom paint or vice versa, the white blows out and the black has no detail and the raw file allows me to get the detail out of the shadows and bring down the highlights. Why do they store them in the water? I mean, mm -hmm. Well, so, sometimes they encase ships, uh, they, they did it in uh, Long Beach, uh, the, uh, what is it, the Queen Mary? is sitting encased, uh, but you know, it's not easy to get a big ship to sit on land unless you put it in dry dock where you, know, you bring it into a spot where you can fill it in. And even that doesn't solve all the problems. Um, it seems like they just rust them and they're there for years and what? It, people are gonna shoot me for saying this, but I don't think all ships can be saved. Uh, I think, you know, you have to look at the cost benefit analysis. If you can afford to do it, do it. If you can't afford to do it, the ship has to go, you know. I'm sorry, there was somebody else who had a question? Uh, I don't think you ever said about the, the origins of the tall ship in San Diego, the, the something of India. Started, India. Started, yeah, started life as, I can't remember this. I used to, 10 years ago when my brain was better, I knew all this stuff off the top of my head, but she started as Uterp in 1863, was built on the Isle of, um, Isle of Man uh, as a full rigged ship Uterp. After a career sailing from Great Britain to India and New Zealand, she was renamed, re-rigged as a bark and became a salmon hauler on the Alaska to California route. She was retired in 1926, was restored as a, a museum ship in 1962-63 and home ported at the Maritime Museum of San Diego. She's the oldest ship still sailing regularly and also the oldest iron-hulled merchant ship still afloat, 205 feet uh, length waterline, 278 feet sparred. Um, she's a beauty. You use uh, prime lenses or zoom? Zooms. And there's a good reason for that. I prefer prime lenses, but um, because of the positioning, I often can't back up anymore. I can't get any closer. And because I crop everything in the camera, I don't crop after the fact. Uh, I compose the picture exactly the way I want it on the water. I gotta be able to zoom in and out because I'm often restricted as to where I can be. So like with the Olympia, I couldn't have gotten the whole ship in broadside unless I had a 16 millimeter lens and I just had to go to the widest part. But if I'd been a little further away, I would have zoomed in. Who pays for the maintenance of the convention that in Houston, somebody paid $35 million and then Houston didn't want it. Who pays the money? I thought you were going to ask who pays for me running around yeah. taking pictures because <laughs> that's my wife. <laughs> uh, the uh, um, it, it varies. So a lot of these, a lot of these are run by nonprofits or museums, which are also usually nonprofits. Uh, they get private donations, grants, uh, any which way they can. There's, there's many different ways. Um, I think the state of Texas is probably ponying up some money because they made her the official ship of Texas. So they got to pony up some dough and she's, she belongs to this, the people of Texas, the USS Texas. But some of them are privately owned. It, it's all over the place. Um, yes, very similar. Yeah. Just for the record, everyone say I love the ship, but the combined with the wave straight in the sky just blows me away. I'm sorry, with the what? It blows me away the contrast between the skies and the ship. The way you so, yeah. yeah, so I, I really seek out sunny days with clear blue skies. I don't always get them, which is why I play with the clouds. But it's also what we're talking about with the raw files, with the, because I shoot raw files, which is a geeky photo thing. But um, I can 
I can control the caller to a great extent. So I don't fake the callers. The callers are real, they're there, but they're amplified. I mean, there's the reds can be redder than you see with the naked eye, but it all comes out of the camera. I don't, I don't doctor the images. I don't remove things and I don't add things. Yeah, the one that had a dark ship and dark sky, I thought that was. The Mishulu. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, that was a gift from God. Like God just shown its little, his little flashlight on the Mishulu for that one. I mean, sometimes it's the luck of the dumb, you know? I remember, uh, it's a little late now probably, but going to the kills where all the tugboats are sunk. I debated, so I lived in, I lived right near there in New Jersey on the Jersey shore. And I debated going there many times, um, but somebody's already done that. They, okay. There's a guy out there who's done a killer job with those hulks. And I, once I got my rib, I thought I should go out there and photograph that. But then I decided these are more colorful and they're, yeah. you know, so. It's just such a stellar graveyard. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And you know, the one thing I missed and I blew was the, the Navy would keep all its surplus ships in a bay off San Francisco Bay. I can't remember the name now. And they had, what is it called? Uh, I'm not sure, but they had dozens of ships laid up there. And I was like, I just got to get a boat over there. And I'm, I'm going to be like a kid in the candy store for weeks, you know, just go roam around those ships. And I flew over San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago during the pandemic, coming back from California. I drove my daughter to California and I got on the plane. I flew out of San Francisco airport and I flew over that bay and there's only two ships left. And I photographed one of them on my iPhone through a hole in the clouds and that was it. So I'm a little too late for some ships, but anything else? Um, I came this evening because my husband was interested and I thought I was I just want to tell you that I'm going away. I don't, I'm really not interested in ships, but it's fascinating. <laughs> and the images are beautiful. And I'm going to message me. Thank you. Thank you. You made my day. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.